So let's get started. So uh, last time we talked about strong duality, zero-sum games, and complementary slackness. So can anyone remind me about what the statement is for strong duality? Yep. If there's an optimal for the primal, it must be optimal for the dual as well. Yep. Yeah, exactly. So that's one way to phrase it. I like that. The other way we can think about it is just we have this annoying technical, uh, technicality that neither P or D might be feasible, but at least in the special case where P or D, or both, are feasible, then strong duality told us that their optimal values, which potentially could be plus infinity or minus infinity, are actually equal. Now, in the case of zero-sum games, that was one place where we applied this, was you know, once we had strong duality, it's a tool which we can uh, bring to bear in many different settings. So things like min-cut, max-flow follow pretty easily from strong duality. Also, some of the other things that we studied about looking at things like the minimum mean cost cycle and how that compares to having reduced costs and trying to minimize, uh, maximize the smallest value, that also can be cast as a linear program where strong duality gives you some interesting relations. Now we can also cast things like zero-sum games as uh, LPs. And in that case, what does the statement that their optimal values are equal uh, translate to? So what's the notion of a value when we cast it as a zero-sum game? When we cast a zero-sum game as it? Anyone remember? Uh, yep. The um, optimal play expected value? Yep. Yeah, exactly. So the key word for this is the game value. So strong duality told us that if P or D are feasible, their optimal values are equal. And in the special case of zero-sum games, P and D represent LPs for how much the two players can guarantee themselves if they choose the best possible randomized strategy and have to go first. And the fact that those values are actually equal is what gives us the notion of a game value. in the context of zero-sum games. So today we're actually going to cover for the first time algorithms for solving linear programs. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to start off with, we're going to cover what's called the ellipsoid algorithm, but we're going to use it for two different purposes. So the first one is the more standard one, as we're going to talk about how to go from being able to answer certain types of queries about a polytope or a convex set called separation questions, and we're going to leverage that through the ellipsoid method to actually give algorithms for optimizing over these convex sets. So the first part of today's lecture is going to be from separation to optimization. And what we'll do in the remaining few minutes after we're done with that is we'll actually go the other direction. So really the ellipsoid method, which is what we'll be covering today, our first algorithm for actually solving linear programs instead of just reasoning about their properties, is something which is going to give us a very powerful statement about the equivalence between two different views of what you want to do with convex sets. One is just decide whether a point is in it and actually provide a certificate that it's outside, and the other is actually optimizing things like linear functions over it. So let me be a little bit more precise about what our goals are. So the first part of lecture, we're going to be studying uh, the usual notion of going from separation to optimization. So here the setup, and this is where the ellipsoid method will save the day, is the following. So we're going to assume that we're given some convex set that we care about. And in fact, we're going to be presented with this convex set with the following guarantees. So one issue that's going to come up when we talk about doing things like optimizing over convex sets is we need some notion that this convex set is neither way too big nor too small. Because we're going to try and make progress on its size when we're trying to answer questions about it. Well, we're going to be given this promise that whatever convex set we care about is contained within some gigantic ball. You can think of this radius as being very large, something that's polynomially large, maybe n to the 100. 
when the problem size is n. And all this is is the set of x's, let's say, whose Euclidean norm is at most r. So this is a promise that uh, whatever polytope you're given is just not obscenely large to begin with. So a lot of linear programs and special cases of LPs, things like max flow, it's easy to figure out some very uh, generous value of r that certainly contains all of the solutions you could ever care about. Now the other promise that you're given is also that it not be too small. Otherwise, this isn't a meaningful guarantee by itself. So what we're promised is that, well, we could have a situation where p is the empty set. But we're promised that if p is actually not empty, so it actually does contain some points, then p actually contains some much smaller ball for some a, for some center a. So this would be the set of points whose Euclidean distance is at most little r from some given point a. So these are the setup for the ellipsoid method. This is the guarantee that we have on the convex set that we care about. Now the other thing is that we're going to assume a powerful way of answering questions about this polygon or general convex set. You can think about asking questions like, given some point, is it actually contained within the set P? We're actually going to start off with an even stronger assumption, which is what's called a separation order. So not only can this separation oracle answer questions about whether or not a point belongs to the set P, but it'll even give you a certificate that it's not in P when it doesn't belong. So let me explain what a separation oracle is, and then I'll tell you what the goals of the ellipsoid method are, given a set, convex set P with these properties, that it's neither too big nor too small, and given some mechanism for answering separation questions about it, we then will want to optimize linear functions over it. So a separation oracle is going to answer queries. These are just individual points, x, that might or might not belong to the set. And what it's going to do is the following. So if it's either going to assert that x really is in the set P, or what it's going to do is the following. It's going to assert that x is not in P. And on top of that, it's going to give us some C. Ooh, I'm running out of space here. So that C transpose Y is strictly less than C transpose X for all Y's in the polytope. So this is a type of proof that the point is actually not in the polytope. Because what it's doing is it's giving us some direction. And I'll draw this geometrically in a minute. Which, when we look in that direction, for the given query x, we get this value when we take their inner product. And yet, lo and behold, for every single point that's actually in the polytope, we get a strictly smaller value when we take their inner product. So this is much stronger than just answering that a point is actually not in some polytope. It's actually giving us a direction which is violated that we need to move in the other direction in order to actually get close to our polytope. So does the notion of a separation oracle make sense? This is the setup for the ellipsoid method. Are there any questions about this? Yep? Uh, isn't the second assumption kind of strong? Because you could have a set that's living in some subspace or something like that, right? And it won't contain it at all. <laughs> ah, so oh, you're talking about this assumption right here yes. about this. Uh, right. So that's true. But what you could be given instead is you could think about um, uh, you could instead think about restricting the dimension of your space to that subspace, and then you would have this type of property. But that's a good point, is that you know, if it actually is in some lower dimensional subspace, we would have to find that lower dimensional subspace, and then talk about restricting it to that set in order for this to make sense. Are there other questions about this? Otherwise, I'm going to draw what it means, what a separation oracle is actually geometrically doing, so we can get a little bit of intuition about what's going on here. So geometrically, yeah. 
we can think about P as just being, let's say, a polytope. So we have these types of linear constraints on it, and it lives in this region. And now what happens when we're actually given some Cori X is it's not only going to respond that X doesn't live in P, but it's going to give us some direction C, which when we think about where C is, well, everything on one side you know, contains x, and everything on the other side is what's going to contain p. So that tells us that actually in this direction c, we actually have a separating hyperplane that tells us that x is actually bounded away from p. So this is geometrically what's going on. Are there any? Yep. Little r, is that any value, or is that a parameter? Of so this will be a parameter of our algorithm. The way that you should think about this is this is the setup for the ellipsoid method. We're going to have guarantees that are going to depend on the ratio of these two things. In fact, what's going to happen is you should think about when you want to apply it to some particular linear program you want to solve. Capital R is going to be something that's polynomially big, like n to the 100. And little r will be something that's polynomially small, like n to the minus 100. So how exactly to set those is a little bit of a technical detour. But you should think about those as things for which, for reasonable problems, they're polynomially bounded, both upper and lower bound. Yep? I have a question, a question about the geometric intuition. Yep. If the hyperplane were, were shifted over slightly, uh -huh. so that the, just a little point of the polytope were on the other side, uh -huh. why would it not be possible? You're talking about shifting it in this direction, though? Yeah. Uh -huh. So now you have some points in the polytope that just barely cross the hyperplane. Yes. Wouldn't they have small dot products? So might the how does the constraint be? So that's a good question. Let me there? clarify. So C here is a direction. So C is actually it's not given by some you know threshold. It's just some direction. So the point is that because as you shift along this hyperplane until you actually reach C. <laughs> you get a situation where that value is larger than any of the values earlier on that you get for the polytope. So actually, you can think about this two ways. You can think about it as either being given a direction C along with some threshold, which C transpose X is larger than the threshold, and C transpose Y is smaller than the threshold for everything that's on the polytope. Or you can think about just setting the threshold to be whatever it is for X, and then that has the property that for anything in P, it's actually strictly small. Okay. So there's actually two equivalent things, and it's good to not get confused that C here is just the direction. It's not actually an offset of how much shift of this hyperplane is. But that's a good tip. Yeah. Also, when you say that P is a subset of the uh, radius R ball, yes. um, are we not, so are we looking at any, are we looking at a particular coset of P? Could you just shift it outside of that? That fault, right? Ah, you mean, should I put, uh, are you asking, should I put a different center here, yeah. potentially? Well, see the, so I haven't told you yet what the goal is for the ellipsoid method. Let me tell you what that is, and then let me get to your question. So this is the setup for the ellipsoid method, is that we're given these types of promises, that the polytope is not too big and not too small, and that we're given a mechanism for answering these questions about the separation ripple. And the goal for the ellipsoid method is actually going to be to output any point x that's contained within p, or to show that p is empty. So this is actually a bit weaker than the types of things we've been talking about so far, because it's really called a feasibility problem. And we'll get back to the question about how to use ways for answering this algorithmic problem to get things for actually optimizing linear functions over P, right? So in general, the types of things that we talked about when we talked about strong duality, we're not just given some polytope P, we're given some direction that we wanted to optimize over. But here we're actually asking a weaker question that's actually equivalent to it. It's just given some set P, well, is it empty or not? And if it's not empty, find me a point in it. So, so the point is that uh, here, I'm actually going to choose 0 to be the center because it doesn't really cost me that much. As long as whatever center I chose was also polynomially bounded, I could just scale up the radius and still have it contain it. But here, what's important is the asymmetry in these two conditions. 
if I had the guarantee that if P was non-empty, that it contained the ball of a zero little r, then I claim this problem would be pretty trivial. Why? Check zero. Check zero, right? So that's why there's this asymmetry in these two, and I don't need to uh, allow an arbitrary center in here for the types of things I'll be talking about. But also, of course, no one's just if you knew that this were true for some other center, you could just apply it to p minus that. Exactly. exactly. So it really doesn't matter. The exactly. key point is that we do know that zero, that it does work for zero. Yes, exactly. And we know vaguely where the polytope is. Yes. So this is the setup for the ellipsoid method. This is the goal. Now, just to make sure we're on the same page, right? The setup for the ellipsoid method, actually, I haven't restricted the sets p that are generated by some small number of linear inequalities. That's what we've been talking about when we've been talking about linear programs. And when we talk about some of the later units in the course, things like semi-definite programs, we're going to be working with much fancier convex sets that are actually what are called cones. But here, at least, in the simple case where P is actually some polytope given by some linear inequalities, you know, how would I be able to answer separation oracle queries? So how could I implement the separation oracle for some uh, system of linear inequalities. This is a really easy question, so if it sounds like a trick question, you're probably overthinking it. So does the question make sense? So let me write it out. So how can we implement a separation oracle for LPs? Let's say, for example, that P was the set of X's where AX is less than or equal to B. I claim that we certainly have a separation oracle for this. This question is way too easy, so maybe someone, yep? Just substitute it 9 by 9 and for one of the lines is going to fail at zero. Exactly, exactly, right? So, you know, here's how you would implement a separation oracle for this polytope is all you would do is you would take whatever x is, that's your query, you plug it in, you check whether ax is less than or equal to b. If it is, then it's by definition in p. And if it's not, there's some constraint, maybe more than one that's violated. And all that you would return for your separating hyperplane would be whatever the row is of a that's actually violated. That would give you something which the inner product against x is actually too large for what it should be, which is the right-hand side. So in fact, this is something that we already know how to do for polytopes and for linear programs, as we definitely know how to do too. The ellipsoid method is even stronger than just solving linear programs. We're going to take advantage of that strength much later in the course. But the strength of the ellipsoid method is that even for convex sets that are not linear programs, as long as you have a separation orbit, which linear programs definitely do, you'll be able to get all the way to being able to answer feasibility questions for them and eventually being able to optimize linear functions over them too. So that's the setup and that's the main goal for today. So does that make sense? Any questions about it? So let me tell you what the plan of attack is. So here's the main idea. The ellipsoid method is very natural. It was actually introduced as a heuristic for trying to solve linear programs and other convex programs much before it was actually rigorously analyzed to show that it actually does solve linear programs in polynomial time. But the idea <laughs> is that what we're going to do is we're going to maintain an ellipse, <coughs> which is a generalization of the ball. We started off with the Euclidean ball centered at zero of radius r. That's something that contains our polytope P. And what we're going to do is we're going to keep shrinking the ball. We're going to use slightly more general objects called ellipsoids, which I'm about to define in a minute. But the idea, at least for the ellipsoid method at a high level, is just to maintain an ellipsoid, which I'll call EK, that contains whatever convex set P we care about. And what we're going to do is we're going to reduce its volume in each step. So the idea is that if we start off with some ellipsoid that contains the polytope, 
In each step, when we query and we find something that's not actually in the polytope, we're going to actually shrink the ellipsoid and make progress on its volume. So this is where capital R and lowercase r kick in, is because we started off with something that was not too big, and we know that if we end up with an ellipsoid that is way too small, that by virtue of this promise, we know that we can just jump to the end and say that P is definitely empty because the thing that contains it has way too small a volume. So that's the high-level idea behind the algorithm. Let me define precisely what an ellipsoid is because that's going to be the workhorse for the ellipsoid method. So what is an ellipsoid? So an ellipsoid is very natural. If you think about it pictorially, you would end up with this type of definition. This is just the linear algebraic way of stating what it is. So what you do is you start off with some center and some matrix capital A. And what you're going to do is you're going to look at all of the points x where x minus the center, that's quadratic form on A inverse, is at most 1. So little a is the center. And you can think about, at least in the special case where a is the identity matrix, what do I end up getting if I plug in capital A is the identity matrix? What is the ellipsoid then? Another name for it? It's the, yeah, it's the ball at center A of radius 1. So this is nothing more than a generalization of the things we've seen so far. See, the issue is that if our goal is to actually shrink the volume of the containing thing in each step, it's going to be much more flexible to allow ourselves the ability to choose an ellipsoid instead of a ball. If every time we maintained a ball and then we tried to shrink the ball, well, there's no ball algorithm, so we would get stuck. So we're going to really maintain, we're going to use this flexibility of being able to do it with ellipsoids. Now, there's some constraints in order for this to make sense. And in fact, the constraints to make this make sense are that you assume that A is symmetric. So A is A transpose. And you also need a constraint that A is positive definite. So let me tell you what that means. We just need that x transpose, inner product on x, is strictly positive for all x's which are not 0. So this is a term that we're actually going to be using a ton when we go into things like semi-definite programming later. This is the first time we're seeing it. It's just the constraint that all quadratic forms of non-zero vectors themselves give you something strictly positive. So this is something which the identity definitely has. And if you were to take any diagonal matrix, what you're really requiring in order for it to be positive definite is that the entries along the diagonal should be strictly non-negative. So they should be strictly positive. And in general, this is how you define an ellipsoid. So are there, yep? Why did we just define this for A rather than just choosing one to be A? Why do we, oh, you mean, why couldn't we just put an A in here? Yeah. So that's fine. It's just that uh, you know, if you think about let's let's think about a special case. So let me answer this, right? So just as another example, if we want to choose the ball centered at zero of radius r, so what we're going to do is we're actually going to choose the ellipsoid, <coughs> obviously centered at zero, but of where the corresponding A matrix is R squared times I. Because when we plug in R squared times I for A, then we get for A inverse is 1 over R squared times I. And then we pull the R squared over here, and we get the usual, you know, that the Euclidean norm is at most R. So the reason we have this funny business, that's a very good question, about going from A to A inverse is that what we're actually doing is that when we dilate this matrix A, we're increasing the size of the ellipsoid. So it's to be natural in that regard that you should think about this matrix A as really representing 
you know, how big the ellipsoid is. And then scaling by coefficient works the way you would expect instead of in the opposite way, which is what would happen if we plugged in A directly in there. But great question. So this is the notion of an ellipsoid. You should check that it meets you know, your own intuitions about what an ellipsoid is. But this is the definition of an ellipsoid. This is what we'll be working with. So now I can tell you, now that we've developed at least some of the language to talk about the ellipsoid method, I can tell you what the outline of the algorithm is, modulo one step. So here's what the ellipsoid algorithm is. And the rest of today will just be focused on proving that this really does work, building out from special cases. So here's the ellipsoid algorithm, just formalizing this intuition and this idea. So we're going to initialize our starting ellipsoid, E0. And we want all of these ellipsoids to contain the convex set that we have, that we're trying to find a point within. And what else would we initialize it to, except for the ball that we know contains the entire set P. So we start off with an ellipsoid, in fact, a ball, whose volume is not way too large. And what we're going to do is we're going to keep trying to shrink it. So each time, from k to m, where m is some number of iterations that we'll get into how to actually set that later. As we get into the proof behind the ellipsoid method, it'll just fall out. Well, the idea is that what we're going to do is if our current guess for the ellipsoid has some center, a, k, and some matrix, capital A, k, and if this is the current ellipsoid, then what we're going to do is we're just going to query the separation interval, the thing that we talked about how to implement when we actually had a linear program that was immediate how to do it, but we can do it also for other convex sets too. We're going to query the separation oracle at the point AK. Now, what we do here is pretty natural. So, you know, if AK actually belongs to the polytope P, well, what should we do? We should just output it, right? So this is important because here what we're talking about is just the feasibility question. We'll get to the question of actually how to optimize linear functions over P later on. But since our goal is just to solve the feasibility problem and find any point, well, if the center belongs to it, then we're great, right? And the intuition behind choosing the center is kind of obvious, is that the current polytope we have is contained entirely within the ellipsoid. So we're quoting a very deep point in the ellipsoid so that if that point belongs to the polytope, we know we're done. But if it doesn't, we can make a lot of drastic <coughs> progress in shrinking it because we know an entire region in which the polytope does not live. And that gives us room to actually try and shrink the outer constraint on the ellipsoid. So if A, K actually belongs to P, then we just call it a day. We can output A, K. And life is simple. And otherwise, what we need to do is if we're given some answer, C, which recall that um, you know when we talk about asking <coughs> questions through a separation oracle, well, either we get the the answer that actually the oracle asserts that A K belongs to P, or when it doesn't, we actually get a proof in the form of a separating hyperplane that it doesn't belong to P. So if we were given some answer CK, which is when the separation oracle returns no, the point is not in the polytope, we actually use what direction it's away from the polytope to try and make progress so that we can shrink EK. So what we're going to do, and I'll tell you how to actually do this and fill in the details in a, in a minute, but what we're going to do is we're going to find some new ellipsoid EK plus 1 that contains the polytope P intersected with all of the x's for which CK transpose x is, well, strictly less than CK transpose AK. So we're some way, somehow, going to find an ellipsoid 
which actually, first of all, contains all the region that we now know our polytope lives within. Initially, when we started off with this outer ellipsoid, the polytope could have been anywhere within this outer ellipsoid. But once we have the separating hyperplane, we know that the polytope actually lives in this upper half of the ellipsoid. We're going to find a tighter ellipsoid, EK plus 1, that contains the new set. Now, the key thing about EK plus 1 is that we're going to want that it's volume, that the way that we actually go about finding the CK plus 1, which I'll fill in the detail in a minute, actually makes a lot of progress on the volume. That's the heart of why the ellipsoid method works. And oof, I'm really running out of space here. And otherwise, if you get through the entire algorithm and you don't actually find any point by querying the sequence of centers through the different ellipsoids, well, by virtue of the fact that the ellipsoids are making a lot of progress in their volumes, and based on the way that we'll set M, you'll have reached a contradiction and you'll have shown that too small a volume ellipsoid contains the polytope, and hence you can actually assert that the polytope was empty to begin with by virtue of that promise and the setup of the problem that it's neither too big nor too small. So this is the ellipsoid algorithm. Does this make sense as a high-level goal? Any questions about this, or does it not make sense? Good? Yep? So is this only the first part of it? Is there another optimization phase that's going to happen, or is this just as feasibility? So this is just for feasibility. So the outline for today is we're starting off with that set, where we have a polytope that's not too big, not too small. We're given a separation orbital. We just want to answer the weak question of whether or not there is a point in the polytope, find any such point, otherwise assert that the polytope is empty. So as you'll see, and that we'll cover after we do the ellipsoid method, is that actually solving feasibility sounds like a much easier question than trying to optimize hey, over it. Yep. I think it should be it contains EK. But EK plus one contains. Ah, yes, good point. Just thank, thank you. you. Yes, thank you. All right. So what I was saying was that at first blush, feasibility, that's why I was trying to make an emphasis about this, feasibility sounds like a much weaker problem. So if you think back to the things we've covered, things like max flow, you know, what if instead of asking you for the max flow, I ask you for a flow? That's a pretty easy feasibility question, right? You answer all zeros. Well, it turns out that actually being able to answer general feasibility questions for arbitrary polytopes P is actually equivalent to being able to optimize over those polytopes too. So we'll see why exactly that is. Yep. Um, is that big R value, are we just given that in the problem statement? Or yes, we, or exactly. Or we have to find that with like the layer? So a lot of times, uh, so if you, this is a little bit of a technical detail, which is that, so the algorithms for linear programs, remember that I told you that there are no strongly polytime algorithms for linear programs. So all algorithms for linear programs are weakly polynomial. They run in time polynomial in the description length. So what actually happens is the, what you do is you work out what the description length of an LP is. It's the natural thing, which is just the sum of the sizes needed to write down all those rational values. And based on what that description <coughs> length is, you can come up with a polynomially related upper bound R. So this is something which is gigantic, but this is where the weekly polynomial comes in is that if you give me something of some description length, then that allows me to actually translate it to upper and lower bounds. Getting the upper bound for capital R is easy. Getting the lower bound for little r requires something called Kramer's rule. Yep. So big R is going to depend polynomially on n and m. Yes, and the bit complexity of the actual values in the matrix A and the vector B. And so that m over there has to be something that's logarithmic in R? Ah, uh, yes, and it will be. Logarithmic in the ratio of the two. Are there other questions? Yeah? Um, if you're going to get to this, it's fine, but like, how do you find the tables? That I have not yet specified. Okay. So that's actually where the secret sauce is in all of this, is you know, how do I actually find the EK plus 1? So I don't just want to write something like find the minimum volume thing, but we're going to write down a very particular way to go about finding n EK plus 1. It actually really does make progress in terms of the volume, so that's actually the heart of the issue. 
are there other questions which aren't uh, about to be answered in a minute or two? All right. Otherwise, uh, let's move on. So in fact, you know, most of the first part of this lecture is really trying to flesh out what this statement means. How do we find the CK plus 1? And why is its volume actually much smaller than EK? And in fact, the way that we're going to flesh out the statement is we're going to start off with something that sounds like a much easier special case, but actually captures everything that's going on with this problem. So here's the idea. So you, know, you should really think about this part as being motivated by trying to answer this question. Right? So the main question we're trying to answer is, you know, is there a good choice for EK plus 1? And not just is there a choice existentially, but how do we find it? So I promised you a special case that actually sounds embarrassingly easy. But this contains all of the insights of the ellipsoid algorithm. So let's consider the following special case. Well, you know, what's the world's simplest ellipsoid? Yes. Just plug in zero and the identity. And I claim if we can actually figure out what to do in this case, we'll actually figure out how to do this step in general of finding EK plus 1. The ellipsoid method is no more complicated than just understanding this one special case. And in fact, I claim that we can even make this simple, right? Because you know, when we're actually given this world's simplest ellipsoid, the ball, well, you know, in general, when we get an answer from our separation oracle, it's going to be giving us some arbitrary direction CK. In fact, since this particular ellipsoid is symmetric around all the directions, why don't I just assume that actually the direction we're given is simple too? So without loss generality, I'm going to set CK to be minus E1. So E1 being the standard basis vector that has a 1 in the first coordinate and zeros everywhere else. This is, without loss generality, what the separation oracle responds with. So let's just try and understand this really simple special case where we have a ball and one of the standard basis vectors is actually the direction of separation. Yep? So I see the algorithm. Once you have this ellipsoid, why, why, is, it, why is it important? Why is it important? Yeah, the ellipsoid that you, that you find. Uh, EK plus 1? What's that? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, um, can you elaborate on that question? What do you mean by that? It seems like you, you want to use it for solving the LP, right? Yeah. But that doesn't describe how LP We're only talking about the feasibility question right now. So, I know that feasibility sounds like it's a much easier problem than optimizing linear functions, but it's not. So, yes, you will see that. Here's a simple way to think about the intuition so that you guys aren't worried about this. Mm -hmm. What can I do if I actually want to optimize a linear function, C, over some polytope P? Well, I can add in a constraint that C transpose X is at least some other constant. And then I can do binary search over what that constant is. That gives me a new polytope, which is the set of all solutions that are feasible and whose objective value is at least something. And then I can just binary search for that. We're going to give a slightly better reduction than just that. But that's the idea is that because you can play with arbitrary polytopes, mm -hmm. you can incorporate the linear function into the constraints. So feasibility really is the same as optimization. So for the time being, bear with me that feasibility is an interesting problem, awesome. even though it sounds trivial in the examples we've seen so far. So x is feasible for the LP? Then. Yes. Okay. Yeah, Sorry. exactly. Are there other questions about this? No? All right. So let's move on to the special case. So we start off with the world's simplest ellipsoid, and we have this direction of separation, minus E1. And in fact, you know, let's do the following. Let's just guess the answer, right? So if you think about it pictorially, just to make sense of what you should do, you know that in this polytope P, that all of the first coordinates, x, x1, are non-negative. 
So what you're going to do is you're going to create a new ellipsoid that's not going to treat all the coordinates the same like the starting ellipsoid does, but it'll shift its center slightly along the x1 side and then be able to shrink some of its different diagonals. So let's just guess the following <laughs> solution. And this is exactly what the solution does. I'll call this E prime. We're going to let it be the set of x's where we're in n dimensions. So what we're going to do is we're going to have the following constraints. So my new center, actually in the x1 coordinate, is going to have a center which is 1 over n plus 1. And the key thing is that this thing that's multiplying it is actually strictly larger than 1. So that's what's allowing me to shrink slightly the axis along just the x1 direction, is that the range of values that I can allow in x1 around this center, 1 over n plus 1, is now strictly smaller than 1, what it used to be. And we have to compensate on the other directions. So we're actually going to make those principal radii a little bit larger than 1. So we have the constraint that for all of the other coordinates, the sum of the xi squared, now times n squared minus 1 over n squared, so something strictly less than 1, all of this is at most 1. So this is definitely an ellipsoid. And it's doing the right thing in the sense that it's moving the center. Instead of the center being all zeros, the new center is what? What's the center? One over n plus one and zero. Yes. One over n plus one and all zeros. So it's shifted. Sorry, what? We should be squaring the x one Ah, you want to say. Yes, thank you. The new center is one over n plus one is the first coordinate, and then all zeros. So we've moved the center slightly in the direction that we know that the entire polytope is contained in. So it kind of looks like that picture. Now the rest of the thing is actually showing that E prime works. So what are the two things that we would have to show that in order for this to be a good choice of E prime? Yeah. Where's the question? What is n? n is the dimension. Uh, yep. So this is better than to show that uh, it contains all the possible points and it's smaller. Exactly. Those are the two things, so that's exactly the game plan. So now that we've guessed this E prime that works for this one very easy sounding special case, we have two things we want to prove. We want to prove that E prime contains P, because that's the invariant that the ellipsoid method is maintaining every step of the way. But then we also want to prove that E prime has made progress. After all, we could have just stuck with the old E and not made any progress. So the way that we're going to make progress is by showing that the volume is noticeably smaller than it was before. So we're shrinking this outer ellipsoid that contains, for sure, the polytope. So let's move forward with that plan. So the plan will be exactly as you said. So claim number one, which these are all very easy claims. They're just purely algebraic statements once we've guessed this magical E prime, is that what I claim is that if x actually is contained within the original ellipsoid, E, and x1 is at least 0, so it's on the correct side of the hyperplane that we found, which was the response from our oracle. Then what I claim is that it actually belongs to E prime. So this is the way that we're going to execute a statement like this, is that this would be our E, and this would be our E prime. And we want that every point in this original ellipsoid intersected with our hyperplane, which is now minus E1 transpose times that, well, better have, uh, better also be contained in the new ellipsoid. Yeah? Did you mean the subscript of x over 1? Uh, did I mean what? The subscript of x over 1. The first coordinate. The first coordinate. Well, like, is that x the same x as the one in E? 
X1 so is the first coordinate. X1 is the first coordinate. Oh, okay. Yes. So another way to write this, just to be clearer, right, is that this is the same thing as uh, E1 transpose times X, right? Which then we're really getting minus E1 transpose times X. That's our CK. So this is the way that we actually implement our separation oracle, is that it's just picking out a single coordinate. So this is a little bit easier because of this without loss generality statement I made, because the ellipse we started off was symmetric at the beginning. But this is the first claim, so that's implementing the first idea. And then we'll show that it actually does make a lot of progress. The proof of this claim is actually pretty boring. Because what else would you do but plug in the X and actually see that it works? A lot of the hard part is actually done just by guessing that E prime is the right ellipsoid. So this will just be a purely algebraic manipulation. And well, now we get back to a favorite. Anyone ever called this the FOIL method when they were uh, when they were first learning it? We're going pretty far back, right? <laughs> I don't even remember what FOIL stands for. First order. That's like inside the inside last. Sorry. <laughs> so everyone loves doing FOIL because it's so easy. And we have the x1 squared term. We're going to have the cross terms, which we've canceled one of the n plus ones in the numerator. And then we end up getting one plus, uh, plus one over n squared. Now the important thing here is actually recognizing what these terms mean and actually giving an interpretation based on that. So this term is nothing more than n squared minus one over n squared plus two n plus two over n squared. That's just rewriting it. Uh, but two? Two. Oh, sorry. Two. Yes, so the two from the cross term. Uh, now the important thing is actually just recognizing what this term is because what are we gonna do? We're gonna match this part of the term, which carries an x1 squared with it, with the same term, which has the summation i from two to n of xi squared. And now when we, if we add the second term in, well, everything's gonna work out magically. So lo and behold, we get n squared minus one over n squared, but now, times summation from i from one to n instead of two to n of xi squared. And we're gonna get a two n plus two times x1 squared minus x1 all over n squared plus one over n squared. And now I claim we're in great shape. So this term right here is certainly at most one, why? Yep. Because it had to be inside of the ball. Because it was inside the ball to begin with. This term, this entire term, I claim is at most zero. Why? Yep. Um, x1 minus one is negative? Yes. And x, well, and x1 is positive. Yes, exactly. Right? So x1, yeah, exactly. So x1 is at most one, so we end up getting this overall term as less than or equal to zero. And then all we have is we have the one over n squared, and we have at most n squared minus one over n squared. And that gives us one. And that's it. Right? So then any x that's in E and has this constraint met necessarily is in this new ellipsoid E prime. Because just by direct calculation, we actually checked that whatever point x that is actually does meet this inequality that defines the ellipsoid E prime, right? So this is just magical algebraic cancellation. This is claim number one. The more interesting thing happens with claim number two, which is equally simple. So let's see how claim number two works. And then from that, we're going to be done with this special case, and we're actually going to talk about why this actually implies the entire ellipsoid algorithm works. So 
flight number two is now the statement that actually the volume of E prime is noticeably made products. What I claim is that the volume of E prime divided by the volume of E is actually at most E to the minus 1 over 2m plus 1. What about most you mean? Oh, wait, did I say most? Yes. But you could have written some that was, that was exactly the if you want. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But this way, I'll actually be able to uh, multiply through whatever upper bounds I get throughout my ellipsoid algorithm. I'll just get something nice in the x one. Now, in fact, the other thing is that in high dimensions, there are all these annoyances about what the right coefficient is when computing the volume of something. So in a lot of cases, it's a lot easier to work with ratios of volume so that you don't actually have to deal with this. You know, when you talk about the volume, of the ball of radius r, you're going to get an r to the n term, but you're going to have some annoying terms in the front that come from the fact that the volume of, of radius 1 ball is not 1. Right? So instead, we're going to ignore all of these issues by looking at the ratio of volumes. And actually, so the proof is very simple, is actually the volume of an ellipsoid is itself proportional to this is where all of those annoying coefficients if you actually wanted to write out the volume would come in but they don't matter for us because we're going to give something they're proportional to well it's proportional to the product of its side lengths so this is what gives you intuitively obvious statements, like if I take a ball of radius 1 and I dilate it to a ball of radius r instead, then how much have I multiplicatively increased the volume by? I've multiplied it by an r to the n. It's just because that's exactly what the product of its side lengths are. When you go from the origin, you go exactly along the axes, the principal axes, and measure how far you can go, and those are the side lengths you get. Well, now we can write out explicitly what this is. We can compute exactly what it was if we wanted to, as Michael was alluding to. And what are we going to get? Well, we'll get n over n plus 1 from the first term right here. Because if you talk about at the center, starting from the point 1 over n plus 1 with all zeros, then how far could you move? You could go out until you get to n over n plus 1 away from the center to begin with, along the x1 axis. And then for all of the other directions, you're going to get a term that's actually larger than 1, n squared over n squared minus 1, but to the 1 half power. And you get this n minus 1 times. And this is all over 1, because originally the ellipsoid we started with had the product of the side lengths just being equal to 1. So, you know, what you're going to end up getting, so this term right here, it, it's just 1 minus 1 over n plus 1. And this term right here, we're going to get 1 plus 1 over n squared minus 1, so something a little larger than 1. At the end of the day, what this gives us is it gives us, it's at most, e to the 1 over n plus 1 times e to the n minus 1 over 2 times n squared minus 1. And we cancel this guy and get an n plus 1. And lo and behold, we have e to the 1, e to the minus 1 over n plus 1 times e to the plus 1 over 2 times n plus 1. And this works out very nicely. It's actually one of the most pleasant set of constants to work out with how magically that works out. Sometimes they're a lot uglier than this. And that gives us the claim, right? So in the special case, where we actually started off with the world's simplest ellipsoid, and we started off with a very simple separating hyperplane, we're done. We know exactly how to figure out what the new ellipsoid should be. We have a very explicit expression for it. And that ellipsoid not only contains all of the points uh, that could possibly be in the polytope, but it even makes good progress in terms of the volume that it actually decreases by something pretty non-negative. So what I want to show you next is how this actually implies the overall ellipsoid algorithm should work. 
that the special case might sound like we've made the problem much easier, but it actually captures the heart of the issue. So let's see why that is. It's I think I'm going to erase claim one since that's something we're definitely not going to need. Next few steps. All right, so now on to the full ellipsoid method, right? So we have this general case, which is, we in general start off with some ellipsoid <coughs> at some center little a with some matrix capital A. Yep. So is it possible to draw a diagram of what's going on? Because my intuition is that this volume ratio should be bounded by a half. Is that not the case? Uh, so here, right? So what's going on is we have this ellipsoid uh, e prime. And what we're doing is we're looking at you know, it's all of its axes. I mean, I've drawn this not really to scale. Oh, and it's the dimensionality. Yes, n is the dimensionality. The point is we're looking at what the side length is along the coordinate x1, which is the thing that's actually strictly less than 1, because it's the region which we've actually moved the point along the center. So the center is no longer at all 0, but it now is at 1 over n plus 1 and all zeros. And then we're multiplying it by all of these different side lengths that are now larger than 1. And those go out of the board, too, because we're in higher dimensions. That's why we have this n minus 1 in the exponent. But the point is that even though this term becomes larger than 1, this term becomes smaller than 1 and overcompensates for it. And that's why we actually get this e to the minus 1 over 2n plus 1 is things have magically worked out. So that's pictorially what's going on. Yep. Do we actually need to change the other axes? Why can't we just shrink along one dimension and then leave all the rest? So, would well, it would not be an ellipsoid. It would. It wouldn't it necessarily contain points. it. Though. So, if yeah. for example we kept oh, well, all of yeah, these yeah. points one here, okay. so that's actually the issue is that we really do need Chop to widen it out point. in order to compensate for this. Yeah, and the claim I erased. Yeah. Yeah. The, the shape we're trying to draw an ellipsoid around is a hemisphere, right? Yep. Okay. So we. Compress it a little bit along the hemisphere axis and spread exactly. it. Exactly. That's exactly right. See, the reason is that we could just work to the hemisphere, and that could be our out of bounding object, and that would be tighter. But then we'd start getting much more complex objects. So the idea is to keep starting from scratch each time with a simple object, which is an ellipsoid. So the question really is geometrically, when we started off with a hemisphere, how do we actually contain that within an ellipsoid? That's made process in terms of the volume. And now the question is, how do we actually handle the general case? So if I've left this little time for the general case, it must be because it's only the special case again. So let's see why that is. So what I claim is that uh, what we can do is we can actually reduce to the special case. Because here are the facts that we're going to need. We can prove these pretty easily. Fact number one. Well. So this is something that we're going to be relying on uh, later. And we'll talk in more detail about it later when we talk about semi-definite programs. But recall that when we talked about which A's define ellipsoids, we had this constraint that A is positive definite. This was that if you take any, so A is symmetric, A equals A transpose. And if you took any non-zero vector x and looked at x transpose A x, that the resulting quantity you would get would be strictly positive. That's the notion of positive definite that we had up there when we talked about ellipsoids. But actually, it turns out there's a very nice if and only if statement for when this holds. Is it holds if and only if A is the product of two matrices, B transpose B, for some invertible. So the idea here is if I wanted to prove to you that some A was positive definite, then if I gave you this form, B transpose times B, and that actually, lo and behold, gave me A, then it would be immediate that A is positive definite. Right? Because A is certainly symmetric. If I take the transpose of this entire thing, 
the B goes on the other side and becomes a transpose, and this B goes on the first side and becomes a B. But moreover, when I take any vector x and take its quadratic form, what I'm getting is I'm getting the Euclidean norm of Bx squared. And because B is invertible, that has to be non-zero for any non-zero x. So you should think about this as actually one side of this fact is obvious, that if A can be represented this way, it's certainly positive definite. It turns out that the two statements are equivalent, and this is a very basic fact in linear algebra that we'll talk about a bit later. But for now, let's take it for granted. And the second fact that I claim, which is the key to all of this, is that, well, invertible linear transformations They actually preserve volume ratios. So invertible linear transformations, think about something just like dilating different axes. Well, that certainly changes the volume. But the key point is that when you take two bodies and you actually apply the same linear transformation, you don't actually change the ratio. So what you do to the volumes of those two things is actually the same. So you can prove this, for example, using the Jacobian if you want, but I'm just going to take these two facts for granted. Because now we can talk about what the plan is. Right? So the plan here of action of how to actually proceed is we're going to start off with some ellipsoid, EK, which let's say it has the form like this. What we're going to do is we're going to find some transformation T that's going to map it back down to our special case, the world's simplest ellipsoid. Well, we gave away of actually finding some new ellipsoid, E prime, that contains it. That works actually for any separating hyperplane that you give me. I would just have to rotate it and then unrotate to find E prime. That's not a big deal. But now that we've solved the special case of you know, being able to find a smaller ellipsoid when we started off with the ball, well then, we can get back the general case just by applying this linear transformation T that maps the ellipsoid to the ball, and then unmap it to get back what our new ellipsoid should be. So that's the idea, is that actually, without loss generality, you can just transform your coordinates so that the ellipsoid you're starting off with really is a standard unit ball. So this is the plan for attack. I'll just tell you one or two words about how to actually make this precise using these facts. So, and then we'll go back to actually how to set M in the ellipsoid method. So the way that we're going to make this precise now is that we can do is we start off with this matrix capital A, which by assumption is B transpose B because of this fact, because of fact number one. And let me tell you what the magical T is that's going to work. So we apply T to some point X, and all it's going to be is it'll be the following. We take B inverse, because B really is invertible. We take its transpose, and we multiply it by X minus A. So this magical choice of t, well, it has the property that if we just think about what it means for y to be in a standard unit ball, so having Euclidean norm at most 1, then we can write out using t an equivalent statement of what that is just by plugging in what y is. And we're going to get this big expression, x minus a transpose times b inverse, because taking the transpose twice, times b inverse transpose times x minus a. So this is just rewriting what y is based on our choice of this linear transformation t. But now, can anyone tell me what this guy is? A inverse, exactly. So this is a inverse. So this is our standard ellipsoid constraint. This is the constraint, E of little a, capital A. And we've now figured out a linear transformation to apply to points, so that being in that ellipsoid is the same thing as after the transformation, being in the standard ellipsoid. And now that finishes the entire thing, because 
we've actually created a linear transformation that preserves volume ratios, and that allows us to actually implement this plan. So the only thing that remains is that, you know, putting it all together, What this plan gives us is it says that wherever you are in the ellipsoid method, you figure out what this decomposition is for A into B transpose times B. This is a plan for how to compute this linear transformation T. That then gives you some ellipsoid that's actually E of zero identity. You apply this rule that we just talked about for finding E prime, and then you undo T by actually taking T inverse to get back what your new ellipsoid E k plus one is. Because of fact two, because these linear transformations preserve volume ratios, that tells us that actually now, given a general ellipsoid, we really have solved this problem of finding a new bounding ellipsoid that not only contains EK intersect the region where the polytope must lie, but we've also done so in a way that this new ellipsoid has volume that's actually at most e to the minus one over two n plus one times the volume of the old. So the only thing that remains is actually how to set M for the ellipsoid method. So let me tell you how we can set it, and let's see why exactly this works. So let's set it to be N squared natural log of the ratio. Remember that these ratios are gigantic now because they depend on the description length of, you know, of our problem. Actually exponential. Then what we're going to get when we actually plug in this value of m, well, at the end of the day, what we have is we have that you know, if we've gotten to the end of the algorithm, the volume of em over the volume of e0 is itself at most e to the minus 1 over 2n plus 1 times this m value, so you know, n squared natural log r over r, and let's put a constant c in front there. And so what we're going to get is at the end of the day, we're going to get the ratio of the two to something like 2 to the n, if we set the constant right. So now we're in great shape. So can anyone tell me why we're done? Why we know that when we finish the algorithm, that the ellipsoid method didn't not find something because there was something and it failed but because it really is empty. So how can we finish up? Yeah. So now the volume of EM is smaller than the ball of psi with radius r. So then exactly. it can't be a superset of. Exactly, exactly. See, in this constraint that we had in the setup of the problem, if the polytope is non-empty, then we know that it contains some ball of radius little r. The ratio of the, 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 big, poly, the big ball containing it so the small ball that's guaranteed to be within it if it's not empty is at most capital R over little r to the n, but now we've gotten something that's too small as a result of this. So what this means is that uh, if the original polytope was non-empty, then we know that P by definition contains this ball, be a little r, and that implies that the volume of EM, if it's not empty, over volume of E0 is itself at least this ratio. So now actually we we actually have successfully concluded because we've gotten a smaller ratio than these two things. We know that the polytope actually must have been empty, and that's how the ellipsoid algorithm works, right? So this finishes the proof of the ellipsoid method. Are there any questions about this? Yep. I think you found this earlier, but uh, you need to know little r in order to know how many iterations yes. to do. Yes. So it seems like this can't possibly help you have a certificate for a feasibility unless you actually know r. It seems like it's <coughs> People keep asking me this question. We're going to put it on the P set. Okay. So what I claim is the following. Uh, I mean, if you guys are surprised by it, it's a good thing to work out, so maybe it wouldn't be a bad thing. But you remember that uh, the, I said that for linear programming, we don't have a strongly polynomial time algorithm. So any algorithm actually itself has to depend on what the bit complexity is of representing the problem. That has to do with what the dimensions of A are, 
and what the bit complexity is of writing down each one of those values in A and each one of the values in B. So now where capital R and little r come from is it's not hard to prove that if you started off with some polytope with you know, AX less than or equal to B, that you could work out really generous values for capital R and little r that allow this to run in polynomial time. So essentially, if you have some bounded bit complexity A, then any x that you get also can't be have arbitrarily small values. But maybe we'll put that. So this is modulo of the issue brought up that got brought up earlier. That if the answer like if the polytope is restricted to some subspace, yes. then you also have to restrict the exactly. subspace. So, so that's that's a little got bit of a technicality. So why don't we do the following? Let's take any questions about capital R and little r offline for the time being. Uh, any other questions? Yep. Um, so we said that uh, fact two says if the linear transformation is vertible, then it preserves the volume ratio. Right? Yes. Um, so when you go from E to uh -huh. E prime on yep. the reduced case, yep. um, that's not a linear transformation, right? That's you're, nope. you're messing with the... But that's the thing about, that is our construction. So we gave a direct yeah. construction, given E of zero I, and any separating hyperplane, how to actually produce E prime. Okay, so when you apply T inverse on both, yep. it preserves... So there's no T on that arrow. That's actually the special case yeah. that we talked about. All right, so this is taking a bit longer than expected. So let me at least tell you what the reduction is from feasibility to, uh, from optimization to feasibility, and then we'll end there. So maybe we'll do the remainder some other time. So let me tell you about this reduction from feasibility to optimization. And that'll at least give us half of the story of how we can go from separation, not just the feasibility, but the optimization. So let's talk about how you could use an algorithm for answering feasibility questions to actually be able to optimize over the same types of sets. So I'm going to give you a slightly more clever reduction than the one that I sketched based on binary search, but either of those are pretty good. So what we're going to do is we're going to check feasibility for P. And what I claim is that if P is infeasible, we're done. Right? Because there's no function to be optimized because the polytope is empty. So we can just call it a day, right? What we're going to do next is what we can do is if P is feasible, we're going to check feasibility for the dual, right? So we're talking about linear programs specifically. Linear programs, yes. Specifically for linear programs. Now what I claim is that if D is infeasible, we're done as well. This I'll need some help with, so why should that be the case? Yeah? The primal is unbounded. Yes, exactly, the primal is unbounded. Because we only got to that case if P was feasible. If D is infeasible, then strong duality tells us that since at least one of them is, we know that actually their values, their objective functions are equal. And because the dual has no solution, that means the primal has unboundedly good feasible solutions. These are just some technicalities. Now, the meat of the issue when both of them are feasible is actually how can we turn a question about optimization into a problem about feasibility? And here's the entire idea. What we're going to do is we're going to set up a joint feasibility LP. So for example, what I mean by this is what if we started off with an LP in standard form, which we were trying to maximize C transpose X subject to the constraints that AX equals B and X is non-negative. Well then, we're going to look for both a feasible primal and dual solution simultaneously. We're just going to have a bigger set of variables because now we can have y transpose times a is at least c transpose. That's one of the con that's the constraints in the dual. So we now have added in the feasibility constraints for the primal and the feasibility constraints for the dual for the standard form. 
So what should I do now? Yep. Set the objectives equal. Perfect. Set the objectives equal. C transpose x equals y transpose b. So you deliberately set up a feasibility question that asks for not only a value to the primal, but one which is actually certified by a feasible solution to the dual. Of course, if you're you never can... done something with volumes, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so you have to be a little careful about that, but let's deal with that offline. Um, in any case, this is. Are there other questions? It just seems problematic that you get a volume zero. So say, set the difference, say the difference is less than So what you do is you find the span of the directions. So you don't actually do that. Yeah. So you would actually restrict to whatever the correct space is by modding out by the linear constraints. All right. So this is actually the reduction for feasibility to optimization. There's another way to do this. This is a way that's specifically tailored for things like linear programs. What you could do instead is the way that I sketched, which is that if you had good algorithms for actually solving feasibility, one thing you could do is you can just take the objective value and put it into the constraints explicitly by asking for something, which you ask a feasibility question where x is feasible and c transpose times x is at least some threshold t, and then you just binary search for that t. So there's the issue that you, know, you have to worry about how many steps of binary search to do, but that's also another good way to try and reduce uh, optimization to feasibility. So this actually tells us now, just putting this all together, you know, what did we do? We started off with separation, and we used it to actually solve a feasibility question. And this feasibility question we actually used to solve an optimization problem. So this is actually what the ellipsoid method has done, is it helped us traverse this bridge. Actually, the really interesting thing is that you can go the other direction, too, that if you gave me a polytope, which you could actually optimize linear functions over, then you could necessarily actually solve separation problems for it, even if that polytope was not definable by some polynomial number of constraints. So you can actually use the ellipsoid method to traverse the bridge in the other direction, which maybe we'll talk about next time. And that's actually one of the great results about LPs is actually that problems like separation, one of which is very easy for a given LP, is actually equivalent in terms of polynomial time to being able to solve optimization problems, period. So we'll talk about that later. And the other thing that I want to give you a little bit of a glimpse towards is what we're going to be doing in maybe two more units after this is when we move beyond linear programs, we're going to talk about convex programs called semi-definite programs. Those are things which P is no longer definable by some small number of linear inequalities, but will in general have other types of richer constraints. So we're going to study how to use the ellipsoid method to solve semi-definite programs. It'll be immediate. But then we're going to study how those types of fancier convex programs can be much more powerful at designing approximation algorithms. So that's a little bit of a preview of what we're going towards in some of the later units. All right, so that's it. So I'll take questions.